Welcome, dear audience. Welcome, dear audience, somewhere in the World Wide Web watching us. This is the last weekend of the Exposition Imaginaire, and I'm very happy to welcome Sebastian Chukotsky. He's Deputy Director of the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. From 2005 to 2008, he was Director of the Center for Contemporary Art Kronika in Bitom in Poland. He curated, amongst others, the Polish Pavilion at the 54th Venice Biennial in 2011 with the project by Jael Batana called And Europe Will Be Stunned. He curated Early Years, an exhibition at Kunstwerke Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin in 2010, exhibitions with Daniel Knorr or Monika Zosnowska, that was also um, the Polish Pavilion at Venice Biennale. We invited him, not only because he's a brilliant curator, because we, he's also um, the author of several texts, um, including um, experimental fiction and also experimental exhibitions in the form of books, as well as residency programs and staged lectures. To name just a few, a cookbook for political imagination from 2011, the Future of Art Criticism as Pure Fiction, an anthology of text exhibitions, a set of 19 exhibitions, one collateral event, also from 2011, and, for example, the libretto of the Institutional Opera Spoken Exhibitions. Welcome, Sebastian Tchaikovsky. We will experience um, a live performance spoken lecture. He is kindly assisted by Eleanor Taylor, assistant of the dramaturgy department of Kunsthalle Wien. So, Sebastian, Eleanor, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and uh, giving me this possibility of sharing some kind of like shadow curating activities which are not really materializing as uh, setups of uh, three-dimensional tangible objects in the museum spaces but uh, they functioned as uh, radio dramas, uh, novellas, uh, dance performances even though they I really seriously treat them as proper exhibitions even though they sometimes they include like fictional artists and uh, fabricated artworks. Uh, what we are going to do today, uh, with help of Eleanor, who will be also helping with reading uh, some scripts, protocols, commands, we are trying to draw lots. We have some fragments, some excerpts, pieces, uh, textual pieces, or uh, links, uh, we might discover a, a film sample also, we can have like an audio file, and all those excerpts uh, come from different projects uh, realized in collaboration with visual artists. Uh, sometimes it's a kind of long-term collaboration uh, which uh, materializes as a kind of dual, as a kind of uh, never-ending correspondence uh, and uh, delegation of tasks sometimes. And uh, so uh, those, uh, those fragments come from the pieces uh, delivered with uh, such artists as, as, uh, as a Macedonian duo, Jana Czalowski and Kristina Ivanowska, longtime collaborators, uh, the German painter Antti Majewski, with whom uh, I've been working since ages. <laughs> Uh, uh, Monika Sosnowska, which uh, Vanessa mentioned, and they're like uh, also uh, fictional stories written um, for such artists uh, like uh, Daniel Knorr or uh, Christoph Drager and many others. So it's like kind of, it is a kind of shadow or like a background noise of my uh, kind of curatorial or writing activities. Yeah, but uh, the thing is that we are not going to explain a lot, so we don't know the sequence of, the, of, the, uh, of those actions. Uh, so, yeah, we'll follow, yeah, 
Would you like to? Yeah, I will start with the first one. Number four. Okay, this one. This one comes from a novel uh, uh, called *The Mirage*, which was uh, which was uh, produced uh, with with a Polish visual artist Łukasz Jastrupczak, who is like a post-conceptual post uh, post uh, visual artist. And what I'm going to read now, it's uh, it's uh, page number 28. Uh, it's a set of instructions, of manuals, instructions, uh, titled Escapologies. And there are commands for uh, drivers, who might entertain uh, the passengers, activating different uh, different uh, scenarios. Escapologies, direct to camera action while traveling by car. One, a blindfolded journey in the trunk of the car, sacks full of dried herbs, sage, oregano, lavender, etc. Two. Recitation to music of excerpts from artist contract, the artist reserved rights transfer and sale agreement from 1971. Three, animistic journey. A, all passengers travel in dock masks. B, total silence prevails from the beginning to the end of the trip. C, Passengers communicate with each other by displaying packets of colors. Four. Seeds of the hemp, cannabis sativa, shown next to the old signposts bearing the names of the of localities encountered during the trip. Five. Conversation with a hitchhiker intended to change the destination of his journey in such a way that he travels in the direction opposite to his plans. This is an excerpt from a recent exhibition called Making Use, Life in Post-Artistic Times, uh, which was quite an unusual uh, research and exhibition project uh, with the participation of more than 100 participants who are uh, former artists or who kind of emigrated from art to other fields, applying their artistic competences in such uh, fields as uh, agriculture or politics. Uh, but at the same time, we're looking for certain phenomena which uh, look like art, materialize in like artistic forms, but they have nothing to do with art. And this is one of the examples. On March 26, 2009, a YouTube user with the login Whispering Live uploaded a film entitled Whisper One, Hello, which generated huge interest among people experiencing autonomous sensory meridian response known as ASMR. So far, the existence of ASMR has never been scientifically confirmed, probably because of its indefiniteness, the individuality of responses and the susceptibility to specific frequencies. Nonetheless, several million people around the world claim to feel a sensation characterized by pleasant tingling, twitching, and pulsing in the region of the head and the nape of the neck, relieving stress and improving the quality of their sleep. ASMR films record people whispering or speaking softly, 
while performing very mundane tasks, such as folding and shelving items, brushing their hair, opening packages, ironing shirts, and so on. Additional sounds are also essential, such as scrubbing and scraping, or the sounds of a dryer, scissors, pouring water, or the like. Fetishistic or openly erotic films are removed from ASMR channels. Okay, this one comes from a theatrical play uh, written for a Hungarian collective, Little Warsaw. And what we are going to do is just reading the final page, the final possible endings of the theatrical play. I will start. The first possible scenario. An eavesdropping event. Bugging devices have been installed throughout the entire building. In complete darkness, the audience listens to the sounds from various halls of the Palace of Culture in Warsaw, transmitted simultaneously to the theater hall. A psychedelic trip. A group LSD taking session. The group is split into three specialist groups, architects, theoreticians, and poachers, whose task is to solve technical, intellectual, and logistical problems. We dress up as dragons. We set on fire the black cube with their remaining instructions and run off. Occupy the palace. A group of visitors remains in the building as long as it is at all possible. They adapt its infrastructure to their own requirements, sleeping in the theatre boxes, availing themselves of supplies at local restaurants, canteens and first aid boxes, swimming in the municipal swimming pool, using the fax machines and telephones and so on. Carrying all the elements of the stage set around the building in a ceremonial parade. A modified pedonk, game of bulls, competition. The sessions took place in the parade square, lasting a few hours and often more than 10. During the game, the players told stories, anecdotes and riddles. This was correlated to the position of the bulls after each turn. For example, the player whose bull was the furthest from the kushne was obliged to try and to solve one of the previously supplied philosophical puzzles. All kinds of additional props were used and much attention was paid to destructive devices, from a string quartet to hashish. Special guests were invited to give lectures. The, the square was decorated with flowers and spilt flour, which made it easier to see the trajectory of the rolling bulls. Food was consumed, fragments of texts that accompanied the exhibitions were read out loud and subjected to ruthless criticism. The playing field was set out using perfume or spraying gas. The game continued till late at night. The place where the couchonne fell was marked with candles. The, ruling, the, the rules governing point scoring were getting more and more complex. During some sessions, the very concept of scoring points for throwing bowls was abandoned and colour bonuses were introduced instead. The members of the Federation were under orders to actively complicate and modify the rules of the game. So, the end of the performance depends on which scenario is opted for. Uh, as can be seen from the examples provided by us, <laughs> each set of instructions has a different character and differs in the style of the description, the level of interactivity and the precision of the instruction. There are at least 
free instructions that do not allow for the performance to come to an end during the viewer's lifetime. forever problem. If we reduce the time of the period between the creation of the Earth and the present day to that of a year, the first terrestrial plants appear only at the end of November. The dinosaurs are extinct by December 26. And our human ancestors appear only at 6 p.m. on December 30. 31. There is a great probability that uranium deposits will be exhausted in two or three hundred years. What remains as a side effect of nuclear power stations will be still deadly dangerous for the next several hundred thousand years. How can these deposits be marked? so that, from a long-term pers perspective, the message remains legible. We presume that humanity, if it happens to survive the next few thousand years, will not necessarily have a more advanced civilization. It is quite probable that, owing to various sorts of catastrophes, it could regress to a more primitive forms of existence such as those of the Paleolithic period. We have no idea what languages will be used in a few decades, a few hundred years, or a few thousand years, or if writing as such will exist at all. In Finland, a very advanced uh, radioactive waste storage center has been built 500 meters below the air. It will be closed down and buried in about 100 years. The roads leading to it will be torn up and a dense forest will be grow in the place. If in 10,000 years or so another ice age visits the location, how can we assume that when the glacier retreats and a settlement returns, anyone will recall the radioactive waste once deposited there? In places, in New Mexico, where the radioactive waste deposits, signboards warn against digging until the year 12,000. We cannot be sure, however, that either the signboards themselves or the languages in which they are written will survive until the day. Nor can we, can we be sure that, for example, the symbol of the skull and crossbones will be comprehensible to someone in a distant time. This fragment uh, is to be read by you, we are not going to read it aloud. It's, uh, there are commands for dancers uh, performing in a theatrical play called Skarbek. Skarbek is a Polish name for an underground gnome, like underground dwarf living in the abandoned coal mines. And it was those uh, commands are to be danced, to be performed by dancers.
Okay. Uh, the next one comes from this uh, previously mentioned anthology, uh, The Future of Art Criticism as Pure Fiction. It's a way of revisiting Robert Smithson's concepts of sight and non-sight. And we are going to share the duties of reading it. Sight. Sight is familiar, stable, clean, edited, restrained, proportional, clear. Its substance is homogeneous, has an even surface, leans toward alphabetical order from A to Z. It's composed of nouns with corners. Its volume can be measured. It stands out from the background. It's free of parasites and invasive species. It doesn't shrink. Symptoms of erosion are masked. Its boundaries can be traced. The temperature and humidity are maintained at a constant level. It can be described with numbers. It doesn't grow. It seeks order. It is an environment where the same species continually appear, whose average lifespan is increasing. Non-sight. Non-sight is defiant, anachronistic, with a porous surface, imploding, with rot setting in. It dries and flakes, its volume cannot be measured. It is misshapen, unstable, unedited, bereft of corners, can't be picked out from the background, it's dark, shrinking, eroding, its boundaries are untraceable, it has many cavities, it's doubtful, composed of verbs, the temperature and humidity fluctuate over the day and year it grows, is generous, seeks entropy, it eludes the alphabet, some species die out, others mutate and drive out the weaker ones. This is, uh, again, a page from the Mirage novel. It's number 10. Sandbox. Monument. Once there was a sandbox filled to the brim with black and white sand. The black sand filled the right side of the sandbox. The white sand filled the left side of the sandbox. One day, a small child entered the sandbox and began moving around in a circle clockwise and did so for many hours. When the child was finished, the sand was gray. Then the child decided to undo this chaos and began treading in a circle counterclockwise and did so for many hours. The longer the child walked, the more sand, the, the sand was gray. Crying was no help. Chaos had intruded on the sandbox once and for all. Oh yeah, this is a complicated one. It's a mixture of commands, instructions uh, provided, uh, produced for, like invented for artists who were participating in, the, in a residency called the Site Residency on a Gotland Island in Sweden, which is a kind of anti-production residency. Actually, uh, Susanne Kriman, who is participating in the Betten exhibition, she was one of the residents. She was cheating on me, she worked there, like even though like 
producing a new piece is not allowed, but I'm very happy with the results. Uh, but to kind of spice up the experience of not really working and producing anything, the artists who are kind of abandoned marooned in some cottages in the wooden, you know, like wooden cottages in the, in the forest or uh, they are living in a, in a lighthouse. And they have some like small instructions. But there are also instructions for other uh, projects. So it's more than 100 pieces. We can select a few of them. Holding one's breath every hour for one minute. Throwing darts blindfolded towards a large world map. Connecting the entrance door latch to that of the farthest window in a straight line by means of a ball of wool, repeating the activity until the entire ball is unwound. Walking along a line that marks the sides of a perfect square. Sticking clay into all the keyholes of the apartment. This is a complicated command. Spending a whole day in a room with a stranger, different props, each time the combination of objects is different. The choice depends on the host's intuition. Locked away in a box. The key to the box is hidden in an adjacent apartment by a third person who leaves the building immediately after the key is left. Burning books on the floor, an extinguisher, aluminium sheet, glasses for ash collecting piles into a pyramid. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is, this is an instruction related to many traces hidden in those envelopes and also to this guy, which will be probably introduced or not, it depends on the selection. Hopefully, he will be introduced. Uh, so in the instruction, learning to be a ventriloquist, a doll resembling Jerzy Ludwinski, salt and pepper scattered. We can distribute it. Yeah, like we can share those instructions with you, so if you want to activate them during this weekend you can have uh, one or two and keep it for uh, future realizations This is an excerpt from a film adaptation of the Mirage novel. It's a very like um, improvised adaptation, uh, an attempt to track down the traces of uh, fictional artists who are like the main protagonists of the of the novel. destruction are an important subject for you and the history of mankind
and art history. Do you therefore regard museums as serving to present the erosion of ideas and objects that automatically become prehistory? Necrophilia? It's uh, quite a coincidence. We have like another fragment from the Mirage film. It's a short one. This time. Twenty. This is the moment where the main protagonist, Mia, the hitchhiker Mia, is being introduced. The girl standing at the entrance to Highway 80 in the town of Auburn is named Mia. She is holding a sheet of heavy cardboard with the inscription, Everywhere I Haven't Been Yet. 
Mia is determinately carrying out her travel plans. When she woke up early on the morning of March 13, 1971, she drew a large spiral on a map. Eyes closed so that the line on the map would be random. Stretching from the west to the east coast, from the far south to the very north. The drawing was made rapidly without lifting the pencil from the map. Mia promised herself that over the next two years she would visit all the cities through which the spiral passed. The girl runs away from home. She's 16. She might pass for pretty, but you can't get a good look at her because she's constantly moving her head, nervously. She has big cloudy eyes, thick braids, and is developing cataracts. The girl's parents state that she's retarded and headstrong. The girl regards her parents as unworthy of her love. When Mia goes completely blind, which will happen, counting from today, in exactly 247 days, she will be wearing a black leather coat and a heavy dark green woolen skirt. The girl is leaning on a limestone outcrop in Wichita National Park. Additional information, lighted cigarette, moose hair, and in her pocket, a shell of the extinct cephalopod. Gelastiquites for Nivali. Mia is tired of traveling and her head remains motionless. Yeah, that was absolutely like the easiest and the cheapest way of making a film adaptation of a, of a book to ask randomly met strangers to read those chapters aloud. So there are like 50 characters, 50 people whom we had never met before and whom we'll never meet in the future probably, who read the, the whole book for us. We have no religion, signposts, or zoos. Our hearts are cold. They bleed no more. It's all over for flagellation and repentance. The whip and the cane have been tossed aside. Years go by. The cold shells of temples stand empty. The carnival goes on. We are never tired. We make no demands. No cheating, no cheap tricks, no sweating blood. Enough fasting, enough arranging for a better life in a faraway place. Perhaps one day in another world. Enough bargaining, enough collecting brownie points for good deeds and noble thoughts. We take no notice of others. We barely touch one another, if at all. It's no more than chance brushing against others. Sometimes a gentle kiss, the head snuggled into someone's belly, stroking someone's cheek. Physicality is not a forte of ours. Something poured into something shapeless. In our mouths, the taste of corroded steel and salt. We are relics. The future lay hidden in the plot lines of tawdry 20th century fiction films that, that as children we watched in the shopping malls. In the absence of any other guidelines, we relied on what moronic film directors had dreamt up. We had no time to spin visions of our own. We don't have sufficient data from the outside on which we could now rely. There are many gaps in our ceremonies. The world is unfinished. Some plots stop short for no reason. Nothing is profound. Nothing is forever. Everything that has been good in us is flourishing. Base instincts, weak will, and arrogance have finally died a death. Violence is an extinct species on display in amusement parks. Yes, we do also have amusement parks and swimming pools that stretch for miles along woods. We have temples of meditation, small wooden huts and high stilts that rise above the fields. And we also have our art. We apply it brain to brain, eye to eye. We do not buy art, however. We do not hold it. Our, our houses are not for storing objects. But museums do still exist. They have a special mission. We cherish them. They are our temples, our arcs of the covenant, our chariots of fire. 
In small round capsules, we note all the glances that people have ever cast at objects. They contain lust and admiration. They contain love. One day, we will shoot these capsules into space. They will go into orbit and grow in strength. And it is from... <laughs> that was a nice intervention. <laughs> Where was I? One day, they contain the glances that people have ever cast at objects. They contain lust and admiration. They contain love. One day, we will shoot these capsules into space. They will go into orbit and grow in strength. And it is from them that new life will be born. We have relinquished all things, all our things to museums. We no longer need furniture, souvenirs. After all, we do remember everything. Kitchen equipment or cages for domestic animals. Museums deal with material things. Our homes are where the spirit lives. The spirit has a name and a fiscal number. This is uh, Robert Smithson's puppet, which is uh, quite often animated by ventriloquists or like <laughs> puppet actors. And, uh, yeah, he's a good friend, uh, double dead friend. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's a it's a script for a radio drama. <laughs> it's attracted by the corpse, yeah, probably. Yeah, the flies. Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a fragment. It's also a fragment of a radio drama. The show tells the story of a talk, uh, of a talk show featuring a dead person. The medium, a girl brought in straight from Poland, mumbles in a low, indistinctive voice. She chews her fingernails and she rumples her dirty apron. She pours hot wax into a dish of water. She spats at the mirror. She claps and strikes herself on the cheek with a deck of cards. The stage setting is tawdry, like something from a B-horror movie. And the narrator describes in detail the elements of decoration, sofas, black garlands, candles, mirrors. The studio audience becomes bored and unable to summon up any enthusiasm for the old-fashioned performance. When the voice of the dead woman is finally heard, it sounds weak and artificial. Ask me about something, it implores listlessly. The presence of the deceased electrifies the medium, who smiles and sits up. From a sheet of paper, she solemnly reads out in impeccable Scottish questions that strike the audience as peculiar. Why are you not a logical positive? Po positivist? <laughs> Does nature exist for you? What is your critical standard? The dead woman answers only the second question. And her answer is in the negative. A brief scene used in the radio program Pointless Vanishing Points, first season, 1968 to 1972, takes place in the Cordier and Ekstrom Gallery in New York. And so you are interested in alchemy? Yes. Do you think of yourself as something in the nature of a priest? This peculiar American sense of humor is puzzling to me. Does it strike you as plebeian? Yes, that's exactly what I think. And so, the class struggle. Do you regard me as a reactionary? A mechanistic reactionary. You will discover someday that ideas are machines. 
I'm not interested in machines, I'm interested in language. And occultism? Only a science fiction. Chess? Monopoly. In 1975, Revo Pusemp, a conceptual artist of Estonian origin, was elected mayor of the village of Rosendale, New York. His artistic practice was based mainly on spreading ideas realized by others. In seeking the mayor's office, Pusemp seized an opportunity to use his artistic competences in a new field to create a work of art as a solution to a political problem. In the 70s, the village of Rosendale was struggling with numerous infrastructure, tax, and administrative problems. In a referendum, it was decided to implement Pusem's concept of converting the village into a non municipal area, lacking its own administration and municipal status. And thus, the village passed into the jurisdiction of the neighboring township, also called Rosendale. During the entire term, Pusemp never referred to his work as an artistic project. After elimination of Pusemp's civic office, the artist-politician, who enjoyed great popularity and support among the residents, moved with his family to Utah, where he seized his artwork and launched a ski business. And here comes a story. Notional moss breeding was initiated at the Museum of the Earth in the suburbs, Rosendale, in the spring of 2014. This species is very hard to breed, yet, as it turns out, it is also incredibly resistant to changes in temperature and humidity. Initially, it was kept in small terrariums placed in the hidey holes of the building. The moss breeding plant was to provide additional entertainment to those guarding the exhibition. After a secret assembly in the director's office, the guards made a decision to move the most robust moss colonies into the library, to the tables in the museum cafe, and the corridors leading to the room with meteorites, fossils, and a reconstruction of the Amphilicolias fra fra fragilimus skeleton. This decision was probably made following an analysis of a once-a-month survey completed by the exhibition guards. Ever since they were entrusted with the task of protect protecting the moss, a deeper bond with the institution, emotions when thinking about staying in one room with all those museum exhibits, and an inexpressible absolute love to all things, both animate and inanimate, were recorded. The most important feature of the notional moss is its unusual ability to pass various impossible to materialize ideas to other highly developed species. The mystery of how a primitive species could develop such a precious ability has never been resolved. According to one theory, this ability helps the moss survive in new conditions, such as apartments and institutions, as a conceptual mascot for Homo sapiens. This fragment is uh, 
taken from a film project uh, realized with, uh, with a Polish visual artist, Agnieszka, Agnieszka Polska. What a name for a Polish artist. And uh, she uh, produced a film titled Future Days, uh, depicting a heaven, like a paradise for dead avant-garde and new avant-garde artists who are like wandering, uh, walking aimlessly, having those conversations about uh, political engagement of artists and so on, not being capable of producing new artworks, being doomed to this eternity. And uh, the film is an exhibition. It has some pieces smuggled into the scenography for the film. And so we are going to show like a short uh, excerpt from the, from the film. And then I will reveal one of the pieces, like this particular pieces, I will tell what the piece was about and when it was constructed. So first, a uh, short fragment from the Future Days uh, film by Agnieszka Polska. A torn page. Let me see it. Ah, words, sentences. There was an old man of Peru who never knew what he should do. So he tore off his head. So he tore off his head. And behaved like a bear. Into that intrinsic old man of Peru. There is more. Help me. And here. Help. And here. Help. There is a more. Oh, stop. Oh, oh. 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 last. Oh. 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 What happened? Just like you, I was once seduced by the printed word. I'm going to fall into a compost of books, like a swamp. How horrid. How interesting. Avatar Geva threw out books, making a heap, thinking that people would take them and read. With time, the books decayed, turning into a dangerous compost. I don't really know how long I've been sitting here. Every day, the sun would shine into my face from about 9 to 1 p.m. My skin itched, stung. The evening breeze dried off my sweating face. The night shadows created crossword puzzles. At one point, I no longer counted the days. The notion of a present, which is not a transition, but in which time stands still and has come to a stop. So this paper and earth trap into which uh, Poltec, maybe you have recognized Poltec, <laughs> uh, falls, uh, alluding to his many years uh, or centuries uh, of heavenly tedium, uh, is based on a work of Avital Geva, uh, the, the piece was titled The Books in Landscape Experiment, uh, made in 1972. And it was quite recently rediscovered by curators working with the beginnings of uh, land art outside of Western Europe and the USA. And Geva work on the, on the field dividing the Arab village uh, Messer and the Jewish kibbutz of Metzer. Uh, he dumped uh, used books uh, into, into the ground for, he was like doing it for several months. Uh, the books were donated by the members of uh, Ein Shemer Kibbutz. Uh, so in a short stretch of time, uh, mounds of books were created in various places. They were passed by the inhabitants of both villages every day on their work to on the way to work or visiting one another. Uh, the inhabitants dug through the books and took some home or scattered them about. 
The book spread chaotically throughout the area, blown, blown about by the wind, absorbing moisture at night and baking in the sun during the day. Several accounts of the art of the 1970s distort the description of the books in the, in the landscape experiment. Geva is said to have buried the books deep under the ground between the kibbutz and the Arab village, creating an invisible underground library, which is not true. This is probably the result of a conflation of two projects. Geva conducted his experiment by scattering books, while an artist who collaborated with him at the time, Misha Ullman, initiated the exchange of a cubic meter of earth between Metzer and Messer. prayer. We should kneel down. <laughs> 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 um, okay. I believe in form that no one restricts. I believe in a just division of competence. I believe in freedom given to the end user. Let the world be our map. Let it be filled with love. Evil is revealed through ambition. Pettiness is the devil incarnate that weakens our will. Let critics perish forever and ever. Let us pray that the art be the stage and backdrop for real life. Let the good not fill the form but transcend it. Let the artist not be a false god. Let the body of work be our body. Let us pray that we not judge our fellow man in haste that we not flatter ourselves, nor close off the path of development that shall lead us to a new, better world. The form from the premise, the premise of goodwill, and in goodwill the spirit of the future shall manifest itself. Truth in the material that shall be intangible and invisible. Truth in the form that no one and nothing shall constrain. Truth in the function that we shall discover altogether, following the light of love, Amen. One more. Okay. One more. One. Okay. <laughs> Can help us because it's a very hard selection and uh, the guy is still waiting. He hasn't been activated. Okay, Ellie, your turn. In the 1970s, Jerzy Ludwinski, a Polish art theoretician and critic, announced the arrival of post-artistic times to be the result of art's assumption of a completely new form, one which the critical language of his time was not able to do justice. Ludwinski claimed that post-art had an undeniably greater potential than the activities traditionally recognized as artistic. He anticipated the need for a completely new art that would be totally immaterial and independent from institutional support. The critic divided the development of art into six phases. At the stage of meta-art, art absorbs reality in its entirety. 
It will be followed by the total phase, which will mark a dialectical return to the zero phase. Art which cannot be shown in a conventional manner, for instance, at an exhibition. It can only be implied. Members of the new civilization will pass art around among themselves by means of something similar to telepathy. Ludwinsky wrote, all previous notions relating to art are cancelled out, even that of authorship. What matters are the tensions created by the collective effort of many individuals which contributes to the making of one system, pulsating with its own life, like some gigantic work of nature. Art equals reality. Jerzy Ludwinski com compared the development of art to a snowball rolling down a hill, always growing, collecting successive parts of reality to finally become the globe itself. Ludwinski wrote repeatedly about the post-artistic times in which we live and work, indicating the cross-pollination between art and other disciplines. He explained, the more the territory of art is shrinking, the more art is encroaching upon the territories of the apparently victorious disciplines. Art enters so much into the territory of science and technology that they become indistinguishable. The products of new realism and data cannot be distinguished from commonplace objects and natural things. Ludwinski often used drawings to contain his ideas, and his notebooks and lecture typescripts are filled with diagrams, illustrations, and graphs. Some of them are presented here. Thank you. <laughs> I guess that brings that into life. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>